This episode of Fitness Junkies is called Geo Gets His Move Back. I've been trying to stay mobile um, and been focused on that for many years since I turned about 50. That's right, Ron Gallagher from MVPT is committed to help me regain my power and mobility. How fun would it be to evaluate him and, and you know get get down and dirty on this on this knee pain and then little do we know that it, it's it's sort of a thing for you i'm hopeful that he can help me but after years of self-imposed limitations i do yeah. have my doubts but i'm staying positive it actually makes sense other than I don't see how it's going to happen. <laughs> so follow my health journey and the Fitness Junkies podcast on YouTube and enjoy the show. What's up, Fit Fam? This is Giovanni of Geo's Logic, your host of Fitness Junkies. I hope this show meets you in good health and spirits. And if not, I hope it inspires you to do something about it. Today's show is called Geo Gets His Move Back. And we're going to be talking about my favorite subject, me. My guest host is the person that's going to help me get my move back, MVPT physical therapist, Ron Gallagher. How are you? Hey, man. How's it going? Good, good. Awesome. Um, so the reason we decided to document this journey is because I've been trying to stay mobile um, and been focused on that for many years since I turned about 50. When I started doing research into mobility as you age, and, or, or should I say the loss of mobility as you age, and how that is associated with all-cause mortality. So my goal, and my goal for you is to realize that you can move like you once moved until your 60s, 70s, 80s on down. And what we do is we start to negotiate ourselves into a position of, well, I can't do that anymore, so I will stop doing that, even though I love to do that. And then there's something else that kind of maybe causes some discomfort or pain and you say, well, I can't do that anymore. And you slowly, slowly start to slow down. And again, studies show that when the human creature stops moving, the end of life is coming closer. So Ron, we were at your location, at your, um, what do you call it, a practice? It was a clinic. Clinic? And we were filming an early episode of Fitness Junkies, and you noticed some dysfunction in my posture. And that's what inspired you to approach me with this idea. Yeah, we were, we were talking about squatting and deadlifting for ultra runners or, or just runners in general, you kind of in passing mentioned that you don't squat heavy anymore because of knee pain. And, and a little red flag went up in my head like it always does anytime somebody tells me they can't do something. And as you walked away from me, I was like, how fun would it be to evaluate him and, and you know, get, get down and dirty on this, on this knee pain? And then little do we know that it, it's... It's sort of a thing for you. A uh, big thing. <laughs> You're like, I can fix that dude. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So why don't you start by sharing with me what seems to be bothering you the most? So the reason I was so interested in talking to you about my injuries is I recently did a deadlift with an Olympic barbell. Not heavy as far as my normal limits. And I tweaked the right sciatic joint. And I tried one more set. Oh, I, first I stretched, tried one more set, and it was still activated. So I stopped. Um, and 
prior to that, I was doing some sled work, I do a reverse like back pedal. And I believe something was really inflamed on the back side of my knee. And and it's also the front side of my tibia here. So that is kind of the two main areas that are has got me all <laughs> messed up. My left knee is the one where I've had two knee surgeries. So was, um, what surgeries? Uh, cartilage removal. So two arthroscopic procedures just to clean out. Yeah. And then one on the right. How knee. long ago was that? Whew. Um, I want to say the last one was probably 30 years ago. Okay. So a long time ago. Yeah. And then I had one on my right knee. And th those were all in, the, in a period of about three years. And since those procedures, what would you say you've been able to get out of these knees in terms of production? Um, it's limited my um, functional movement as far as squats and deadlifts. Okay. Um, How so? Uh, pain and range of motion. And what type of uh, recovery did you have? Like, did you go to PT? Did you go to yep. Cairo? Or you yep. kind of handle it yourself. PT, PT, and then my own stuff. Um, the knee surgeries also stopped any running. Like, I can't even really play softball and run the first base. Um, and that's mainly because on my left knee, it feels like it's moving. It feels like it's sliding. And that not only makes me worried um, that I'm gonna, you know, do right. something drastic. Right, yeah, I mean, you know, my, my impression of Gio when I first met him was master trainer, you know, loves the gym, tons and tons of really, uh, good results in terms of the clients that you work with and then the shoo, fast forward to yeah i don't i don't do that yeah well how, how i mean this is the same dude you know yeah. how, how does he not do that so that also you know motivated me to say look man you you can't you can't be this guy and then not do that yeah it's really strange like i was saying a minute ago we we start to put these um, limitations on ourselves. Absolutely. Um, based, I would say in life, pain is the, one of the biggest motivators. So we either are moving away from pain or we're moving towards pleasure. Right. So in the fitness world or bodybuilding or whatever you can want to call it, or activity, if something causes you pain, we tend to move away from it. Totally. Even if we love it. Absolutely. And, and ultimately, the, the deck is stacked against you in a way because traditional medicine doesn't have a place for you. You're, you're too healthy for formal physical therapy. You're not going to go to some clinic who's, you know, you're going to be right next to some old lady with a little yellow TheraBand. In your world, when you guys talk to each other, that place is definitely not going to help. So where can you get help? You're, you're looking for health care while that world is offering sick care. Mm. So once, once, you're sick en once you're not sick enough to be there, then they kick you out. You're looking for health care. And that's what I'm trying to do. What's different about my place is I'm actually trying to do healthcare. What do you need to do to be healthy so that you can squat and deadlift without any trouble? It's because if I'm managing my hip and knee position well, it feels good. If I'm not managing my hip and knee position, it feels bad. Right. But your hip and knee position sucks on those step ups, so that's what hurts. Got it, got it, okay. <clears throat> Now, if I pick your knee up and look at it, 
the femur has a little hole that the patella sits in. I call this the track and this the train. Man, my writing sucks today. So the track is controlled by glutes. So if the track is moving because you don't have the hip stability to control it, the train's gonna move on the track poorly. And what people tend to do is try to do something to the train to hold it onto the track. So the hip controls the 100%. Track? 100%. Okay, wow. <laughs> this is a hip problem that shows up as knee pain. Wow. Your degenerative changes in your knee are because you can't control your hip over your knee and the shock absorber is moving poorly. Your body has laid down scar or extra connective tissue to protect the movement from happening. You haven't done anything to stretch that away. You keep taking a muscular approach to move the joint better, chasing your tail. Okay. If you are glute deficient, what your brain will do is activate hamstrings to do the glute job. And if you've been compensating with hamstring for so long, this hamstring pain, because you have inadequate glutes, soon as I take hamstring out of the equation and load glutes, your hamstring, your hamstring misfires and cramps because you don't have the glute strength to hold it up. That's 100% what happened. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so all this has to change and then work down to heavy squat, heavy deadlift. All right. It actually makes sense. Other than I don't see how it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when you gave me your parameters of what my squat and deadlift should be and overhead press. And uh, if you can repeat that, what, what those numbers are. Regardless of your activity, age or gender, I want every person to be able to squat their body weight, deadlift 20% 20, 20 more than their body weight and push press 70% of their body weight. And when you said that, I was like, wow, I'm so far away from that. I mean, if I randomly select 100 people at, at the mall, how many people am I going to, how many people am I going to find that can do that? Right. Probably, probably three to five. And, you know, it's going to be a really motivated person at the gym. It's going to be CrossFit. And the rest are going to be not strong enough to be able to do that. I would guess the overwhelming majority of those people can't even approach a bar with the limitations that they have. And then how many of those people are symptomatic? Right. Back so, hurts, knee right. oh, hurts. Oh, I can't do that. My back hurts. Yeah, right. I would never do that. My knee hurts. Oh, I've got this shoulder pain that, you know, I had. So there's, there's all these reasons why people can't do that. And the number one impairment after these 17 years of clinical experience is absolutely strength. And so that's why I opened a place with platforms and racks and rigs and bumper plates and got myself trained in Olympic lifting because I want an 80 year old lady to deadlift. I need, I need her to be able to move something heavy off the ground, you know, right. and, um, and you know, you guys like you too. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's not only like you said, the way I look and what I do as far as training and coaching and my limitations don't equate. Right. So it's like I'm basically hiding behind my physique and going, yeah, do that that way. Uh, uh, yeah, let me, let me show you how yeah. that's done on this yeah. video. <laughs> you, you know, I, I would say the, one, of the, one of the main things that I walked away from our assessment with was just how profound that mindset is because you, you were humbled and um, 
you, you know, that, and that's a really uncomfortable place. So to your credit, you're willing to have a look at it. You're willing to crunch that. And that doesn't just impact you. It imp impacts how you've trained all these people over all these years. You know, we're talking about a 30-year history with knee pain, 30-year history of you know, not quite sure if this is what I should be doing with them. And inside, that's got to be a, a significant um, force. Yeah, for it's... So so kudos to you for being willing to do that. Not a lot of people's willing to do that. And not that I'm, you know, naked and doing before and after, but filming the assessment and, and my limitations were pretty vast and pretty, I did pretty poorly in a lot of the things you put me through. I think both of us were surprised. I yeah. mean, I, I don't think both of us saw all, I mean, w when I approached you, I didn't have that in mind. And so as, as this whole thing started to unfold, you know, A, it was like, my my heart genuinely goes out to somebody who's had this experience and then be like what an act of god that you actually moved in next door right. and that we both have this passion for performance in a way that we can sort of be parallel with each other and you know what an amazing opportunity to be able to document it to be able to you know get you where you need to go and show this community that people don't have to live this way yeah, and and you know, I'm still I'm so hopeful, but at the same time, been there, done that. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I get it. Can this really happen? <laughs> it, it's a results oriented business. I mean, at the end of the day, if you know, we both like the Dodgers and we both want to go out to lunch and hang out, and you're no better, I like I didn't do my job. So w w you just got to get better. Okay. I, mean, that, I mean, that's the number one thing. It's got, you got to get better. Okay. So um, after, I mean, the big, I think, part of it is the psychology of it. And like, you know, 100%. you have some great um, stuff on your wall, some slogans, some sayings. And I know I noticed, I think on one of your racks, it says, believe. Yeah. And, you know, one of my, I don't know if I have it up here, but it says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I, I say probably five times a day, what you think about what you feel is just as important as what you feel. Yeah. And for you, that's been a lifetime of stretch that you've interpreted as pain and so the more you back off of this stretch, the stiffer it gets. Yeah. And nobody's educated you that way. Yeah. And so the other hurdles that I have to jump through are the treatment um, aspect of my injuries, meaning the icing and the foam mm -hmm. rolling and yeah. the heat and the... Right. Yeah, so right. explain to us um, why you don't necessarily integrate that, or do you integrate that? Into I don't do anything external. There, there's nothing from the outside in that's better than the inside out. Mm. So if we, if we look at long-term data, it's just not my opinion. This is long-term data, lots and lots and lots of... Um, studies show us that the modalities such as ice and heat, electricity, dry needles, lasers, all of those things from the outside in are just as good, but no better than placebo. Mm. So if we really look at what's helping people get better, it's teaching them a behavior modification that they can withstand the stress that they're trying to put on. So, so, you know, you were doing some things in the gym that you didn't necessarily have the tools for. And then at the same time, over recovering. And what that does is it makes your tissue, your soft tissue brittle. So what I'm trying to do is administer a 
stepwise progression of load to be able to teach your body how to react to that load. And the more load you can tolerate, the more things you can do. Now, so I like that philosophy and I get it because many times in my life journey, I've had an injury that I didn't go to a physical therapist for. And over time, through whatever, it got better, meaning right. my body was able to heal whatever was going on. Totally. And that's is that totally. exactly what you're saying? 100%. Back pain is a perfect example. It takes roughly about six to eight weeks for somebody in back pain to spontaneously get better. So that means if you go to a place, whether it's my profession or a different profession, if there's literally nothing changing the tissue that's in trouble, in six or eight weeks, it'll be better on its own. So what I'm trying to do is provide an environment for that tissue for that time to be compressed. And then if there's a, a compensatory reason why that's there, address that biomechanical reason the best we can so that it doesn't come back. Because something like back pain will be what we call episodic, mm -hmm. where it comes on one time, it's not that bad, then it goes away, comes back the next time it's worse, the next time it's worse, and then pretty soon it's a catastrophic problem. So if you address it in those early stages and not just make it feel better, you actually change the stiffness or change the weakness that's causing that problem, then the whole cycle is, is stopped. Got it. So let's drill down a little bit further on those modalities. Like, I guess it was about 10 years ago where I went into the um, self-myofascial release mm. world. Right. And um, which basically is foam rolling and, and mm. balls and all those types of things. <laughs> and... Yeah. I was kind of sold on the idea of muscles lengthening and being at the wrong length and the, the, the self myofascial release right. would actually help lengthen the muscle so right. that the joint would move properly. So right. you're saying no to all that. 100% no. So wh whoever sold you on that doesn't understand n neurophysiology or, or the, how the how the brain and the, and the joints and the muscles are interacting. And what ends up happening is we start to have this discussion between the difference between mobility and flexibility. Okay. You're treating a mobility problem with flexibility. I po absolutely positively hate that foam roller for you. Really? Hate it. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> it's not a joy of mine. Trust me. <laughs> if I could get rid of it, I'd be happy. It's absolutely wasting your time. Okay. Hate it. All right. <clears throat> so the foam roller is improving flexibility. Right. <clears throat> but you have mobility problems. Okay. So that means your your um, your joints don't move through your joints don't move through full range at your knee and spine. So. <clears throat> what we do as humans is, let's say this is our brain and spinal cord. Uh -huh. And as this connection goes, it doesn't matter what joint it is, the, um, let's say we use your knee for example. This is, this is a graphic rep representation of the nervous input that we use. So this is joint and this is muscle. Okay. Notice how I overemphasized the information that's coming from the joint. Uh -huh. So if your knee and your spine don't move through normal range, this is the amount of in input your brain is getting. This is the muscle input happening in the same scenario uh -huh. and you're using flexibility of the muscle to address a joint that doesn't move through full range. So essentially, the joints have probably 90, 95% of the nerve endings that ends up in the brain. And the muscle gets the other 5%. So 
So if we're using a, a, a muscle technique to make a joint problem better, you chase your tail, which is why if you interview all the people at the gym over in the corner with their foam roller, how often they do that, they'll tell you, oh, I got to do it every day. I got to do it every two days. I got to do it five times a week because they're stuck in a cycle where they, they have a, a nervous system that's upregulated because a stiffness or weakness in the joint or the stability muscles that control that joint and they're removing the the tightness that they feel which is a protective mechanism if you remove the the protective mechanism eventually that protective me mechanism comes back if you don't solve the problem mm. <clears throat> so there's mountains of evidence on this foam rolling stretching massage this is probably going to uh, shock your people um just as good as placebo. No inflammatory markers are better. No length changes on a micron microscope whatsoever. Um, and a feather is just as good as a foam roller. Wow. Because it changes the sensory environment the same way that the foam roller does. It, 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 it gives you pain, and that pain is faster than the sensation that's coming from where the injury is and your and once that sensory information gets to your brain first it kind of shuts that other pain off and then once the nervous system resets oh. it's right back to being hurt again so what do you do you get back on your foam roller what i'm saying is identify the joint that's stiff associated with that problem or the the little intrinsic muscles that offer stability to that joint and correct the problem, and then that stiffness goes away. That makes a lot of sense. So unfortunately, the practitioners who offer that get tons and tons of kudos for how much it changes. And there's no way to argue that in the short term, there's definitely a change. But how many people see their massage person once a week? Not many. Well, a lot, actually, the, the injured people who come to me used to see them often, a okay. couple of times a month. Okay. And once it resets, it's right back to being in trouble again. And uh, Because you're not going to the source of the issue, which is at the joint. Right, right. So, <laughs> so in your case, you'd be foam rolling this quad, and you don't have the capsular the connective tissue that surrounds the knee, the capsular mobility to reach full range of motion. So you can relax the muscles, but if you don't make the joint move through normal range, it's, it's, it's never going to be okay with that. So you take the tension away. Once you move around a little bit, it, your nervous system responds to, wow, we still can't get full motion to climb these stairs or get up from a chair or whatever case may be. And then that, protective mechanism is right back on. Wow. So that does explode my head. And because I've dived into those modalities and I'm even onto the uh, massage guns and all that, and that's yeah. all quick temporary fixes. Snake oil. Wow. 100%. It's so popular, popular now, right. all that stuff. Right. I, 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 I'm lucky enough, I'm humble enough to sit in a place where I get all kinds of athletes. And one thing that I've, I've teased people about over the year is this thing that I call bro science. Right. So bro science to me is, you know, if you ask um, Ironman triathlete about race nutrition, or if you ask... Um, a track athlete, you know, college track athlete about race nutrition. If you ask obstacle course racer about race nutrition, we're going to get three super different opinions on what you should do before, during, after, how much water. We're going to get these really, really vast changes in, in what they prescribe. It's my place to educate each one on what's actually real. Right. So what I've done over my career is 
dive deep into those topics and find out what is the best thing to do about this. What is the best thing to do about this? What is the best thing to do about this? What's the best of each one? And then when that whole thing comes together, it's like, well, that's, that's wasting your time. This is a better thing to do than that. And then pretty soon this whole thing comes together and um, now people are performing at a much higher level with, with far less symptoms, recovering better, doing it again harder tomorrow because we can help them perform at their highest level. And it's weird. It's like my <clears throat> mind is going a million miles a second here going, I need, I need to convince him that massage works. I need to convince <laughs> I, I feel it better. <laughs> it feels good. You right. do feel better. Right. But it's not solving the problem. Mm. So, you know, there is a place for that. There is a place for that. I'm not, I'm not advocating that nobody get a massage. But if you're getting a massage because you have back pain, you're adding time onto the life of the problem. Because it is going to relax and you are going to walk out there feeling better. But is the joint that moves that muscle in good standing? Is that muscle strong enough to tolerate the stress you're putting on it in, in a daily basis? And if you can't answer those questions, you're missing the boat. It's very interesting that I'm starting to get an idea of what you do. And it's, it's like functional medicine or, or preventative medicine where they're not coming in to give you a pill for your injury, your, your illness. They want to find out where the, the source of that illness is coming right. from, Right. where you're basically doing the same thing. It's like, I could prescribe all these things that may make you feel good, but until we get to the source of the problem and strengthen that or fix that joint, right. it's just a Band-Aid. 100%. So one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the sayings I put on my wall is there's no shortcut to the top. So, you know, people, people want the fastest way to get there, you know, and that's why some of these places exist because you do walk out of there with a change immediately, but there's no shortcut to actually solving the problem. You know, it's going to require addressing the range of motion deficit it doesn't change overnight. There's weakness problems that have to be progress to a place where you can do something heavy. I mean, there's, there's ladies, women who walk through my place with 20 year history of headache, who in three weeks can put 70% of a, of a push press above their head, and they've been headache free for a week. If you, if you, you know, go to the neurologist and you stop everybody who's showing up for headaches, how many of those people are going to be able to do that much push press? Zero. <laughs> literally zero. Right. And if you put a five pound dumbbell in their hands, it brings their headache on. So it has to be progressed to a place where they can do that. And that's what I mean by there's no shortcut to the top. So let's move on to the other things I use um, traditionally, um, ice and heat. Yes. Um, I've had so many physical therapists and everyone say ice, ice or ice yeah. and heat. And some yeah. say no ice, just heat. Like yeah. anything to any of that? Is it just all band-aids as well? Let's pretend there's two athletes. Athlete A and athlete B are on the same soccer field and both twist their ankle at the same time. Big time ankle sprain. Athlete A uses ice all the time. Every little bump or bruise applies ice. Athlete B never puts ice on, ever. When there's big bulbous swelling there, athlete B is going to respond to the ice where athlete A is not going to have any change. Repeated exposures to the cold decreases your inflammatory response. So there, there is a place for it. But I, I try to give people both sides of the equation. Is this a big enough problem to apply more exposures to, to shorten or to lengthen the response time of your inflammatory system? 
Mm. And if and if you choose to put ice on to get some relief, you'll get some relief. But you can't go to that well often enough to, to turn that process down. Brain goes, ah, we're getting help. We don't have to do that much. Just just wait for the cold. It'll be fine. And you basically teach yourself to over recover. Over recover. Over recover. Absolutely. So <laughs> I've heard of over training, but over recover. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, we we start getting real de- real uh, detailed on high level training, like especially track. Um, really, really brittle folks over recovering in a big way. Um, ice bath massage, um, stretching, foam rolling, all these things to make sure that they get the most out of what they're doing and their soft tissue can't handle the vigors of training. So they're over-recovered and under-prepared, and that's a, that's a fragile place to be. So you're out on a limb here, bro, because, like, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't play one on TV, <laughs> but I do see Didn't them. Didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> <laughs> but I do see them using ice. I know Hyper Ice is now in the MLB. I think it's in the NFL. Um, I see them doing ice baths. I see it's like you're on the fringe and I love the fringe cause I'm, that's where I live with my nutrition and, and yeah. my training and my right. coaching. But there's a lot of people that would say that guy's crazy. Totally. <laughs> I, and I'm, and I'm okay with that because it's a mental game. It's, it's a confidence booster. You want to show up to competition saying, I did everything I could possibly do to put myself at the top. And if I was the uh, health person in their team, I would say, especially in track, you know, you're walking around after a workout and you see this person um, in, in the ice bath and you see somebody getting stretched and massaged, I want you to think to yourself, I'm prepared for this and that person is not. I'm actually ready for this and my body is prepared, that body's over-recovered. They think they have to do that to compete with me. And that's where I'm going to get that, that confidence boost because that's what's real. Now, does some of those um, recovery treatments, are they used to get players on the field quicker, meaning let's just mask their pain or hide it so that they can play in the next game. Right. And where it will hopefully get them through the season and we'll worry about the, the real cause and have surgery in the off season. Very, very common. So we're both Dodger fans. So I'm in the left field p- pavilion, you know, right by the, where the bullpen mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kershaw's pitching today. So I, I got there early, super stoked to see Kershaw pitch. He comes strolling out in his jacket, right, lays down on the ground. His guy meets him, seriously stretched him for 15 minutes. Kershaw has a history of back pain. So 15 minutes, I, t- I timed it because I was like, this, this, is, this is the Cy Young winner, Clayton <laughs> Kershaw, getting stretched for 15 minutes before he's about to pitch and I'm losing my mind because in true current sports literature, that's making him injury prone and it's taken away from performance. There's far better things he can do with that time. He gets up, he um, plays a little catch, a little long toss, comes back closer and has some pitches and then goes over to the bullpen and actually throws off the mound. So a couple of weeks later, he's out for, you know, two or three starts because he injured his back again. And I'm like, I wonder if he can actually deadlift. I wonder if anybody in his team has said, maybe we should stop with the mobility and get you stable and strong and see if you can handle the vigors of pitching two times a week because you have the stress capacity to put up with that. Mm. Instead, they're making him more wobble, 
right before he throws. So now you're blowing my mind again. So are you saying active stretching is good? Static stretching? Static stretching has no place in that guy's or your um, training regimen, in my opinion. Okay. Unless you don't have normal range of motion. And just based on how he was being stretched, he's got plenty of motion. Right. And um, so we would do a lot more active stuff. We probably would have done some stuff behind closed doors before we got to the field. It, I'm not sure what he did before that because I wasn't there. But, you know, he, he wasn't sweaty. He wasn't, you know, he just he had a jacket on. Um, so didn't really, think, didn't really think that he was doing anything before. Um, but, you know, a light deadlift, a light squat, something like that before would have gone a lot further. And then some active stuff. It's so incredible that just like with nutrition and like you said, healthcare, which is ridiculous, you know, it's, it's not healthcare. It's, it's whatever they call it. It's like your symptom care. Right. I call it sick care. Yeah. Yeah. Sick care is perfect. There's so much dogma in how things are supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. Like, and just, just, you, it gets hooked in the media and then it's the way things are. Right. And the truth is somewhere buried deep below all that. Right. Right. And usually people on the fringe, like you, and where I like to be, because I think that's where you get amazing anecdotal stories and right. recoveries and right. health right. that, you know, there'll be an article here or there that says, you know, there's, that's not proven. That's, you know, that's, there's no scientific double blind study right. on that, right. but it's just, it's like, how do you get people to believe that maybe that's wrong? Yeah. I think the the worst statement in, uh, in in English is, well, that's the way we've always done it. Right. We we've always done it that 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 way. So that's that's why we do that because that's what we've always done. I literally hate that statement because you're just doing it because that's what's easy. And what I think happens in medicine is managed care has put us in a place where we have this menu of things we can choose from because that's what we're going to get reimbursed for. That's the only things I can provide. Yeah. I hate that. And you, and you end up hoping that this person gets better and you don't have the full list of tools that can get somebody better. So that's a sick care approach. And, um, I think that has just happened so much that everybody thinks that that's, that that's what's standard. And if you have a family and a busy life and you're happy with your salary, you, you just get to a place where you don't need to look further, you think. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with the tools that I have, and you're not willing to look a little further. Well, I was never happy with that. And in 17 years with, you know, continuing education, I always took extra and went across the country and wanted to talk to the best people and just got educated in a way that was like that, that standard, you know, status quo way of approaching things actually doesn't work. Right. Let's look, let's look at what does work. Had to step outside of my profession and go to strength and conditioning, go to a mental health um, expert on, on, uh, um, uh, confidence. And so that I can talk to people in a better way because we're not taught how to do that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> why, why do CrossFit coaches do fairly good with their injured members? You know, we thought when CrossFit came out that there was going to be just a ton of people injured. And I think that the average person thinks that a lot of people get injured at CrossFit, but they don't. They're not getting injured there. Hmm. There's no more injuries at CrossFit than any other coached recreational activity. There's no more. Hmm. If the box has seven to one or more ratio of, of athletes to coaches, 
that box has people getting injured because they can't be coached. Well, the same thing applies to um, any other coach sport. So it really comes down to the leadership. And, you know, so I just wanted to be educated on each, each individual thing and be able to provide um, what's really happening and help people get away from the, um, the, bro, the bro science. So I love that you're being the maverick in this space. Um, you, you spoke about um, teaching others. Um, yeah. And where are you with that, and how's, <clears throat> how's that going? It's going great, actually. Um, so my podcast is a way of doing that. Um, I'm also um, doing some little talks here and there, actually getting to talk maybe two or three times a month. And eventually what I want to do is have some courses that I can teach other PTs and maybe have an app that, patients can get on that, you know, may, maybe make it more convenient than coming to the clinic. Or if they have something basic, they can, they can just handle through the, through the app, but just try to get this style of care out because, mm -hmm. um, people respond amazingly to it. And I just think that there's a better way to be doing things. And I want more, essentially more fishermen out there. Um, and, I think that's probably the, the best way to do that. Now, you said you did a lot of research. You went outside of your field of practice. And is there any books or mentors that you can have people um, look up? Or you mentioned some articles maybe or anything that you Yeah, could... yeah. Um, there's a book that was essentially Maximum Velocity started and is predominantly a running specialty clinic. The orthopedics are running are superior to say just normal normal clinic. So it's a running book and it's written with runners in mind, but anybody who has who who has fitness on the brain will really appreciate a book called Runner's Anatomy. It's by another physical therapist who specialized in treating runners, Jay DeSherry, D-I-C-H-A-R-R-Y. He has a couple new books. I think one new book that I haven't got to yet. It's fairly new. But it essentially talks about the mechanical side of our body and, and why the chemical stuff doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and, you know, he's got, a, he's got an opinion on how... People should be treated based on that. And so he's been sort of a springboard for me to jump off of and, and look in more. Um, I think How to Be a Supple Leopard um, is, is in the ballpark. That's uh, <clears throat> Kelly Starrett. How to Be a <clears throat> Supple Leopard. How to be a supple leopard is kind <laughs> of in the title. <laughs> is in the ballpark. It's uh -huh. a it's a physical therapist who's in a CrossFit, and he talks a lot about it's it's essentially a physical therapy text written for the layperson. Uh -huh. He tends to be a little over flexible on, in his approach, in my opinion, but it, it preaches movement. It preaches you know the importance of uh, of uh, treating these problems mechanically, and then for strength. Um, I really have gravitated towards a really simple approach like starting strength. Um, Coach uh, Mark Ripto out of uh, Texas, he's got a couple of books. Um, I think those are pretty solid. He's got a pretty narrow mind about how things should go, but he's not wrong. Mm. And he absolutely hates physical therapy which I, I find to be interesting. Mm -hmm. So when I went down there, I didn't tell him I was a physical therapist. And um, I got pinned down in the third day and had to share. And everybody turned on me. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, yeah, I'm trying to convert. I'm trying to convert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought if, if I was paying them to go down there and learn right. that I would be part of the club. Right. But as soon as I said I was a BT, it was like out. Right. And they totally turned on me. Um, but at the end of the day, I walked away with a completely new understanding of why traditional PT fails 
and why he's not wrong for hating traditional PT and why I got to do things a different way. And then that sort of really launched me into full force. Every single person who walks in the door has got to leave with a barbell skill. Wow. So tell the people where they can find you. Maximum Velocity Physical Therapy is the name of the clinic. Max, uh, MaxVelocityPT.com is the web- website. Hyperspeed Radio is the podcast. MVPT is the Instagram. And, you know, it's super Googleable. Googleable. So <laughs> right, right. All those, all those can be Googled. And so we're going to be documenting my progress, um, some of the um, things that he will, will bring into my workouts and, and how he's going to take me through this journey. Um, so you're going to be along for the ride. Um, hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we'll have some amazing results in the next few weeks. And um, thanks for your time. I, I know we got you in here pretty quick today. Um, so That pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, so thanks for watching, everybody. I hope this inspires you to reach out to Ron and to keep watching. So write a review, like, share, and until next time, Fit Fam, I'm out. Oh, 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 oh,